Okay, over here, over there, we're all over the place, and I'm going to explain why we're all over the place a little later on. And I've also put up a rhetorical question, is archaeology worth regulating? Um, because we had some discussions over the years about some of the problems we have in promoting professionalism. So, we went to Disney World, um, <laughs> which is an interesting place, as Terry said, to have an archaeological conference, and I'll make a promise to you now, we will never do something like that to you guys. <laughs> um, it's, it was quite difficult, actually, trying to have an adult conversation in this, in this venue. The architecture is peculiar. Uh, the art that you can buy is extremely tasteful. And, and, and why wouldn't you? <laughs> why would you not want a suspended floating Jesus in a perspex cross? Um, I'm sorry I didn't get that. Um, because it, presumably this is what the Pilgrim Fathers had in mind when they originally <laughs> said that. And, and that was the dream. Um, so, as I said in the introduction, and as Terry has just uh, uh, emphasised, we are looking at a strategic partnership, contents unknown, between the two organisations. Um, and the discussions will continue. These are very preliminary discussions. Um, I think we've already established that what we're not doing in the Disney style <laughs> is marrying the two organisations together. That isn't Terry in the Cinderella coach. Um, and there are reasons for that, because there would be a mess to clear up if we went down that route. So anyway, in the, in the States, um, Jerry and I spoke at some length about uh, CIFA and about fame and about registered organisations. And we were quite brief in the presentations from Mike and Terry. So we're reversing that round. So you will hear more um, about ACRA, uh, which is a sort of a fame uh, look-alike in, in a moment from Mike, and you're going to hear very little from me uh, about CIFA. But just to run through the sorts of slides we were looking at, I explained our position statement, who we are, uh, what we do, promoting professional standards and strong ethics in archaeological practice. So exactly the sorts of things that Terry was talking about uh, with that emphasis on benefits to society. <coughs> and this really is, is the tone that we tr try and strike, authoritative, effective, um, talking about words like recognition and respect. And there's perhaps in discussion, I might talk a little bit more about that because I think that in some of the promotion that RPA does of what the register is and why you should join. They're a lot clearer and sharper than we are. Um, and at the end of this um, presentation, uh, we do have a compare and contrast table, which Jerry will introduce to us. Um, so it is quite interesting just to look at the two organisations alongside. Um, and I explained the stuff that you all know that we champion professionalism by setting standards, measuring compliance with those standards, and promoting those standards, promoting best practice and sharing knowledge. And we do that with um, managing quality through, under our code of conduct, as Terry said, a very similar beast to the RPA code. We have standards for person, for process, and for product. And our person standards, as you know, um, are the accredited grades of practitioner, associate, and member but we measure them very, very differently. Um, it is worth just reflecting on this for a moment. That's how we used to do it, through experience, but we don't anymore. Um, we do the assessment of technical and ethical competence. We have the statement of competence. We have the matrix, which I'll show you in a moment, which will be familiar to all of you who've been through the validation process recently. And we look at what people have actually done. Um, and obviously we ask them to sign the code of conduct. So what we are looking at, you can't read the words, you don't need to read the words, but we are looking at how people have performed in the workplace, whereas the RPA emphasis is much more on the potential of people to be professional as demonstrated by their academic qualification and the research they've done in a university. And I explained a little bit about the legal context for UK archaeology, um, but nothing like as well as Terry took us through the US process just now, which was just a magisterial summary of how it all works. It would be great to get that three-day course in 20 minutes. Um, I explained that 
there is a, we can't agree how to spell license or behaviour, by the way, but never mind. <laughs> um, a license is required in Northern Ireland, as you know, um, not elsewhere in the UK. Very few of our sites are actually protected. You need the landowner's permission, but otherwise off you go. Uh, and anyone can call themselves an archaeologist. Um, and then we just reviewed how the planning process works in the, in the four UK nations, uh, which you know all about. Uh, so that was the rules of engagement, really. Um, now, there are some situations that are common to both, that law and policy requires archaeological work to be done. Our government policies tend to urge compliance with CEFA standards. That's written in now into planning guidance in England and Scotland and is imminent in Wales. Uh, very different from uh, the situation that Terry described. And the government policies tend to encourage, I've put require on the slide, but I don't think that's right, tend to encourage that work is done by competent people. And the policies might refer to CEFA registration and accreditation, but they tend to be more enthusiastic about saying work must be done to CEFA standards and you should use competent people, footnote, CIFA runs a register. Um, we could use that toughening up. But the message is there, really, government does not wish to regulate who is and who is not an archaeologist. They do not wish to regulate the detail of archaeological practice. That's a good thing. They want us to be self-regulating. They want strong functioning organisations like CIFA or strong functioning registers like the RPA. But certainly our governments are very nervous about requiring that work to be done by CIFA members or registered organisations. And that's difficult because it means we're getting this instruction, regulate yourselves, but we are not going to create an environment in which you effectively can do that. And the biggest weakness that CIFA has is not being able to enforce professional standards and ethical behaviour on those people who aren't CIFA members. And there are plenty of them practising out there who are not. Um, the arguments we have to make have to be about public interest. They cannot be about work should be restricted to CIFA members because we want it. It's got to be because work should be restricted to competent people because that way the public outcomes will be guaranteed. And these arguments are understood for other professions, but not for archaeology, I think. We're building on it. That's obviously, you know this. This is a big part of the CIFA campaign. These are top of our, our, our priority list for advocacy is making this case, but there's still a way to go. Um, and I spoke a little bit in the introductory session about supply and demand that we've tended to put a lot of effort into trying to persuade national government, local government and their agencies to require work to be done by registered organisations in particular, and we're now just going over the other side with the client guide to say, actually, let's go over to the demand side and just explain to the clients that it's a no-brainer. You want an accredited archaeologist for all the reasons that I ran through yesterday and which you're familiar with, and if you're not, they're in the book. The other thing, that I think, well, there were two big things that we really talked about that I see as a place where a partnership with RPA could very helpfully go. One of which was we register organisations and RPA doesn't. And Jerry is going to talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But that's quite an interesting area. The other thing that I talked about was the potential that we have to amend our charter if the Privy Council so uh, permits to introduce chartered archaeologists uh, and we will be talking more about that tomorrow. <coughs> That's something we can do. That is something RPA cannot do. That went wrong when you won the War of Independence. <laughs> you know, if, you, if you hadn't been so difficult about that tea, um, <laughs> you would still have access to the monarch and you would be able to become chartered and award the title chartered archaeologist. But now you're going to have to work with us. And there may be ways that we can find a pathway using RPA to chartered archaeologist. Uh, 
And we're all over the place in CIFA, as I've said, uh, and I showed some of these statistics yesterday. Uh, we'll, you, we can look at the numbers in the compare and contrast table a little later on, but you'll see some familiarity there. Um, roughly the same number of members, uh, slightly fewer accredited members. We have 77 more registered organisations than RPA does. Uh, and our members are represented in 32 countries, a good number of which are present in the room today, which is lovely. Um, but we only have about 93 members outside the UK, so it's quite a small percentage, but it's growing and there's a lot of interest. And that's one of the reasons for us going to the EAA conference, going to SAA and so forth. Uh, and those members, it doesn't really, to us, matter where they're working. Of course, they have to comply with local laws. Um, but they also have to uh, uh, apply, comply with our code of conduct wherever they go. Um, you can't shake that off. You've signed up to that. And so we have a role wherever they are. And therefore, like other professional institutions, I don't really believe that we have um, national borders. Clearly, the service we provide to UK archaeologists is much better um, because we're closer into the system. But we can, um, working in partnership, elsewhere um, have a role anywhere in the world but we are not going to compete with RPA because that would be futile and pointless. And that really is what I spoke about. So I'll stop there um, and the presentation will continue with others. There's a, there's, a lot of, there's a lot to talk about but we'll do that later when we finish the introduction.